Welcome to Photo Work. On part two of our interview with celebrity wardrobe and fashion stylist Apuje Kalu. In this episode, he tells us about how we can get a fashion stylist onto an unpaid or even a test shoot, as well as much, much more. Okay. Enjoy. Can you talk about the differences in your workload styling for a fashion shoot versus celebrity red carpet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it is two different spaces in a sense of, um, I feel like you prepare the same. So I think the first thing I do when styling any job is I try to understand what is, what is the job and whether or not... Um, if it's editorial, whether or not I've collaborated with the photographer, the editor's tour uh, for a mood board, or they provided one. And on a celebrity side, what is the event? Where are they going? What was on the carpet the year before, if it's an annual event? Mm. And what is the celebrity's brand? So with both of those in mind, I look at the market, like what was shown on the runways. So what am I going to request? If it's um, a magazine, oftentimes, you know, there's, you have to ensure that their brands are represented, like brands that advertise in a magazine. So they may have a preferred list on brands that you reach out to. So of those brands, who has shown looks that complement the direction of the shoot? And then for the celebrity, it's figuring out, okay, what brands have shown looks that make sense for this particular carpet? or this particular like press event. So, and then it's from there, it's like reaching out, requesting certain looks, um, or are, are you going like, with the celebrity oftentimes you can go the custom route if it's during the award season, which is a whole different uh, perspective as opposed to editorial, is actually creating a look from scratch with sketches with the design teams of the different fashion houses. Um, and when it comes to um, both, I like to have options. Depending on the client, some of my male clients um, two or three things they want to try on. Like Neo, worked with Neo for like, five, like over five years. And he has a very um, specific aesthetic that people, re that resonate with people. He may not always want to wear a suit, but we know like we put you in a suit, it's going to be great. People are going to love it. It's your wheelhouse. You'll do great. That's what it is. But he doesn't like, like if I come in with a rack of stuff, like a full rack of 20 suits, he, it, he's not going to look at 20 suits. Because mm -hmm. he doesn't, he has other things. He could be writing, mm -hmm. he could be you know, recording. So, you know, like, okay, I tailor that so I know what the event is and what I think can work for him. Same with Stefan James. Like, mm -hmm. I, I try to tailor it because they come to me to I provide a service. But I'm also very cognizant of their time. Well, my woman clients, they need to have a rack or, or racks. <laughs> 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 because with women, it's, it's really about, like, you just have to feel, and men too, but women want to feel, like, confident. And I want the clothes to make them feel a certain way. <laughs> And they like to try on things to, until they feel like it's the right look. And I'm okay with that. When it comes to like the editorial side of that, it's we have a, a rack of clothes or racks of clothes. This is the looks that we're going for. This is what you're putting on. I may talk with the, uh, the photographer or fashion editors on set to see what looks resonate with them. Because I often know if you guys are inspired, you guys shoot not better, but different. <laughs> different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you. Yeah. <laughs> so you, I, I'm really, I've learned that too. Like I've learned, even with my friends who are photographers, I'm like, I know what they love because you guys shoot it and you just shoot it. And you'll get great shots and everything, but just the level of attention paid to things that you like is different than things. It's like, okay, I think, okay. But then I also learned that balance, like, well, the, the editorial may call for this, so we need to shoot this, make sure we get this shot too. So um, I tried to do a good job of balancing between like the two, like showing. So that's like really like the difference comes to really down to um, the number of options that, um, that I have, but the process of thinking about them are very similar because it's really, it's driven, it's driven by either the magazine or the red carpet. Um, it's driven by the celebrity and it's also driven by like the uh, mood board. So the mood board on the uh, editorial side. Mm -hmm. So many things to juggle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so much. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. Cause actually during the Oscars, I, <laughs> I had to do, I was doing client Stefan James for the Oscars where he presented. Mm -hmm. And also I was doing two shoots in Vegas that following week. Well, so on Sunday was the Oscars. Mm -hmm. I had to be in Vegas Sunday evening. Oh. Therefore, I had two shoots on Monday and Tuesday in Vegas that we were prepping for as well. Mm -hmm. So it was a whirlwind because Stefan, we ended up doing a custom Etro look, which, which was 
flown, hand like delivered from Milan on Friday. So we hadn't fit him or did anything until Friday. He just trusted, like, this is the look. We were going with a one designer and we had to shift directions due to some things that the designer with like controversy, stuff like that. So we had to end up like shifting um, a course. So, and with that happening, I'm also sending, my team is sending emails, we're doing requests, looking at lookbooks, trying to gather all this stuff that's either going to be shipped to me in Los Angeles or to the hotel that we were staying at in um, Las Vegas. So literally, my assistant left um, early to go to Vegas to kind of prep. I had to go dress Stefan and also his his brother, who's also an actor, Shamir Anderson, I had to dress them both and get them to the carpet because I'm, I'm very... Um, uh, I want to. I always want to ensure that people look great, and I find that if I have to go to the carpet to the last minute to, to where they can't say, "Hey, you can't come on the carpet," mm-hmm. I'm there to make sure every little thing is right because I've seen that when I'm not there, sometimes like they're in the car, like they're relaxing, the mm-hmm. bow tie isn't right, the tie isn't right, the strap is off, and public is like they have a lot of things to think about, and I may say, "Hey, can you just make sure they look great?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah," but to them they look great, but for me, I know what I want them to look like, what they should look like, so I will go to the carpet and make sure like that happens. So I did that and made sure that they were great. Uber took Uber back home to go to the airport. You know, so I'm seeing I'm I'm in the Uber looking at the look on the carpet. You know, instead of you know at home enjoying it, you know, right. heading to a, a photo shoot. So two different worlds, but a lot of work goes into both. But they both are really rewarding when you see like the end product. What can photographers do to uh, get a stylist on board for a shoot? Specifically a test shoot, since it's yes. not paid. It's not yes. paid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I often, like I said, I speak about like doing, even my team likes to doing free work because if the photographers have a very keen eye or they're um, specific about what they want or they're collaborative. So if you have a, a great body of work or you just have a good eye, because sometimes people are newer and may not have like a vast body of work, but if you have a great eye and I have like the capacity to, to do it, or even I may even send an assistant like like to to do like the look, looks on set, I'm definitely willing to work with um, photographers because you never know who you're going to meet on set. You can be great hair, great makeup, great photographers. Like I can rec- recommend you for jobs and vice versa. So the first thing is making sure like, you know, either your Instagram or your website or your your portfolio on your agent site like looks great. Like that, you know, you have whether it's curated or you have a good portfolio, but like I can understand your voice. And does your voice resonate with what I'm trying to do as well? Mm-hmm. Because test shoots have to be mutually beneficial, like to everybody. Right. Like you know, ideally you don't want them to be one side, you want to be able to get something out of it as well. Just like, you know, if it's a shoot and you guys are shooting all three quarter or portrait shots and I have shoes on, uh, you know, a, a model or a client, I'm just like, hey guys, um, I get sometimes like this shot resonates with you more, but let's look at the total, like the full look. Mm-hmm. And I've gotten to the point where like, let me know if you're getting shoes this time. If not, you know, I won't worry about putting them on them. Or I love this look. I'll communicate. Say, I love this total look. Can we make sure we get some strong full body images? Um, yeah. so also like the, the photographers being, um, open to being collaborative is like very key to me as well. And even now, like when I was first starting off, I was very like hands on when it came to like the direction of hair, makeup, like lighting, like location scouting. I was very involved in all that. Um, but now it's like my, my schedule is more hectic. So I'm like, well, if you come to me with these things already in place and I don't have to think about it as much, I just have to execute and I agree with the vision. It's like, okay, this is great. This is easy. I can make this happen. I made it just have looks sitting in my house from a pool that I did already. Mm-hmm. Because I said, maybe easy. Like, okay, sure, I have this already. I can I can put this together. Me and my team can put looks together. Boom, let's go do this, this shoot. So I think like having a, a voice, having a portfolio, and having making sure like your your teams, like the people you bring in for hair and makeup are as strong as you are and as strong as a stylist. It's key as well because if one thing is off in a photo shoot, everything is off. Mm-hmm. Like we all have to work together for like for the final product. And I've learned that it's not always about like one person because I hate to see shoots where people are fighting. Like you can tell mm-hmm. like hair one of their moment, makeup right. one of their moments, styles one of their moment. Well, sometimes you have to kind of play the background to a look, whether it be okay, this is a, a, a really a strong hair and makeup moment. So maybe that the look doesn't need to be as like over the top. So it's finding ways that that people are collaborative. 
How important is publication for a stylist? Does that help convince someone? It definitely does more? because that that determines the level of the pull the person can do. I mean, pulling meaning from the showrooms mm -hmm. or from the designers. So certain designers only lend for certain kind of or uh, publications. So unless they already have that stuff on hand, then the publications definitely do matter for once once a salary gets to a certain level in their career. But again, me, if if a team is good and I have the capacity and again, even if it's not me, if I can send someone from my team to go, I'm always down. Um, if it's going to be a good image, if I'm going to get a good quality image at the end, like I have to be able to use something from right. the shoot. Yeah. Oh, when it comes to working with photographers, especially ones that you haven't worked with, do you like it when they are collaborative and they come in with, or do you like when they come in with a specific mood board or do you want to work on the mood board with them? Uh, for me, it depends on my time. Mm. And the project. So if it if it is like a spec shoot or like an editorial that we're pitching, and um, we're all trying to figure you know figure it out, figure out like what's the direction, like what we're trying to do based on the publication, I wouldn't mind working on the mood board with the photographers like together, like to be to be collaborative in that space. But if the photographer has something that they really really want and it makes sense, I'm definitely open to that as well. So I don't have a preference on it, but where I think the difference is coming where we're only shooting what the photographer wants to shoot. Because at that point, I'm a personal shopper and not a stylist. Like, you aren't collaborating with me. You're dictating, like, I want to shoot this, this, and this, and that's what I want to shoot. That's where it's like, okay, well, then we, you should maybe hire someone. You should just hire someone to get some clothes for you, and then you shoot it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So the collaboration comes not only on the mood board part, but also when it comes to selecting the looks for styling, you know, for the um, editorial. So that's that's key to me as well, making sure that we're collaborative, all of us. And the same even goes on the like the, the celebrity side because oftentimes the look will dictate like the lighting, um, the hair, the makeup. Oftentimes, not always. So if we start there and figuring out, you know, how does this all make sense and how do you see it being shot? Or if you see a look that you love, I love this look. I think it would be great here on this background. Okay, how do we make this work? So I, I'm really big on collaborating and making sure that everyone's voice is heard, but also we all respect each other's lanes as well. Are there any tips or tricks or are we just way off base on how to protect some of the clothing that you're loaned or mm. borrow? For one thing that I have that I think a lot of makeup artists should have is um, this mask where it's like it's, it's a zip. You put it over the person's head mm. so they can put the clothes on without getting makeup on it. Yeah, I get them off Amazon, and I often gift them <laughs> to groomers <laughs> and, and, and makeup people mm -hmm. because I don't need this white shirt, you getting the makeup and stuff on the clothes. That's one thing that I live, I live by, and it's astonishing to me that more of them have even never heard of it or don't have it. So I always keep these little, these little uh, masks, and you, know, you just put it on, you zip it, you, you zip it, and you put the clothes on and take it off, and it's like... No makeup, like it's great. So like that's something I use to, to protect clothes. I also let the model or whoever know like, hey, this is going back. Or, you know, let's be careful, be cognizant of that because I've had makeup people, um, artists. I we did this one shoot and like this lady, she bronzed the entire like the, the entire celebrity mm. and I put this cream like sweater on the um on the client and I didn't know that at first. So she took it off. I was like, Who's paying for this? Yeah. Because this didn't, wasn't going to a store, it was going to a showroom. But even if I'm borrowing from a showroom, I still like to make sure I return the clothes the way I received them. Mm -hmm. So the publicist had to pick up the dry cleaning bill. Mm -hmm. It had to be dry cleaned because there was no way. I'm like, you should have you should have communicated that to me before. Like you know, even if you even if you put setting spray, that was going to come off. Mm -hmm. So um, dry cleaning. Dry cleaning. Sometimes I often I, I, I get things dry cleaned even when I'm returning to different um, showrooms from celebrities. Uh, unless the brand is offering to cover it, I personally, I make sure I um, get things dry cleaned. Wow. And I noticed that I'm, I'm one of, I'm probably one of the few that do that because I talk to some showrooms. They're like, oh, you never get that done. I'm like, well, if I get it and it's crap, I take it to my client, then they're going to see or smell this stuff mm -hmm. on it. 
if you may not have had the time to get a dry clean, so I'd rather look out and make sure that the next person is not having to deal with what my client may have done. Mm-hmm. So getting things dry clean, because I have a dry clean that get things done within like three or four hours. So that's another cost you're paying for. Um, of course, like taping, like shoes, using gaffer's tape and like felt, you know, to absorb like indentations and stuff on set. Like that's a whole thing. Um, you always like tape shoes. Um, also like the... Um, the, the strength of the clip shoot you're using. I've, I've had a time where someone was assisting me and they used binder clips yep. on a mink jacket. <sighs> yeah. That was a $5,000 oh, mistake. Ouch. Yeah. It was bad. Oh, gosh. So making sure you understand <laughs> the fabrics and if you're clipping something for fit, like what do you use on it? Do you use um, maybe a spring clamp with like less tension on it? Do you use a safety pin? Do you use a T pin? Like what do you use understanding those fabrics? So that's how you, how are you protecting like those, those things? Like that's also um, key as well. And um, I also do temporary alterations all the time. Things that can be refurbished and let back out. Hmm. So even for carpets and stuff, too, or, or editorials, if I have time or a budget, um, so I'm not, like, trying to fold the pants under, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I have my tailor do a, a temp alteration, as long as I know the fabric. So understanding fabric, I, I can tell, well, will you be able to know if this was altered temp- temporarily? You know, if not, then I'll, I'll have them do it, so. Oh, we've kind of covered a little bit, but what is your creative process? Well, when it comes to, let's say, so my creative process, I'll talk about the Oscars. Yeah. So my creative process for that was um, when I was styling um, Stefan, he was presenting, and it was his first Oscars. So I wanted to make sure that his look was consistent with what we had been building throughout his press run. And we were very particular about like color and cut and texture because oftentimes guys get lost on the carpet in a sea of like black and white, you know, and, yep. and, and navy. So how do you make sure he stands out as true to brand, but still on trend with the award ceremony? And we were, um, I know I wanted color because for Golden Glows, where he was nominated, uh, we did this double-breasted velvet Ralph, Ralph Friend purple label tuxedo, like full velvet. And I kept it traditional from that perspective because it was the Golden Globes and it was his first one. He was nominated. So we tried, we played it safe, but still added a pop. And um, like we did these like cap toe gold etched uh, Louboutins and I added a really cool lapel pin. So those things, like those key details were important to me. So when it came time for the Oscars, um, a couple of designers reached out and um, we decided to go like the custom route. And um, when I talked to Etro, they were very open to collaborating. It was like, this is what we're thinking, but what are you thinking? So um, we knew we wanted to, 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 we knew we wanted to do color and we decided kind of like in the burgundy, Bordeaux, Oxblood like kind of realm. Um, Cause I wanted to play off of being Canadian. And you know, the, the Canadian oh. colors are like red and white, okay. right? But you have to be careful because the carpet is red. Right. Mm. Yeah. So I was thinking about that too. So when we decided on on the final sketch, I knew I wanted to, to do three pieces. And Stefan agreed, because um, I don't see enough three pieces on the carpet. Mm-hmm. And um, we knew we wanted to, to do texture, so we decided on like the red. Um, like we had like we narrowed it down to four different options, and Stefan gave me his top two. So I was like, okay, I see these two. So I went. I went with. Um, I talked with the other uh, design team and said, okay, I like this. But this feels still a little traditional in a sense. So I went and did research on different tuxedos that Etro had done in the past. So I looked at some different embellishments that they may have had on things. And I saw one thing that stuck out to me, which was this trim. They had done it on one of their um, old like runway shows, like from, um, from fall 20, 2012 slash 13. Um, they had like this ribbing on like, this black tuxedo and it was silver. Like it, it was like or silver or gray like trim on it. I'm like, hmm, I think this will look good on our tuxedo, but I want it to be monochromatic. So within the same tone as the tuxedo and it's still on trend with the brand because even though it's custom, you still have to be considered, you have to still consider the brand itself and how is it still true to that particular brand. So when I sent the picture over to the design team, I said, I love this. And they were like, oh, what about orange? I was like, mm, no, it's already a red, like burgundy red tuxedo. 
and it's the Oscars. I said, I feel like maybe like no. On the <laughs> so I'll say, I said, I think I wanted to be, you know, in the same tonal range as that. And they found something. So after that, I kind of just trusted. I, I trusted in, like the design team, like to do their thing. I didn't really see anything like in the making because again, we had to pivot. Um, we had to pivot. So when I finally saw like the final product like on a mannequin, I was like, wow, okay, this looks really good. Cause I was, I, w- I was nervous. I was nervous. Um, because again, the Oscars were on Sunday and they said it would be here on Friday. And I was like, all right. So when we got it, um, I had already reached out to different brands to get shoes. So like, do we go traditional, like black, um, do we go, um, like burgundy, but then like, actually when I saw it, it looked more red than burgundy. When I saw the picture, I was like, okay, well, it looks a little more red. So I requested all these like burgundy shoes too, cause I wanted to, to, to possibly do monochromatic if it made sense. So, and I also requested these pair of like white Giuseppe Zanotti boots that had like this, like dragon on the back of the heel. Super cool. Some of you wouldn't traditionally see for the Oscars. And the brand also made a, um, they made a burgundy bow tie and cummerbund. I was like, well, we can extra cummerbund because we have the vest. But the tie just didn't give it that pop that I thought we needed. So I end up going to the fabric store. Once I once I fit him, I, I got the tuxedo in. We had the burgundy bow tie and I had a black one that I already had. And it just wasn't working. So I went to the fabric store and found a similar fabric and again, same tone and had my tailor make the bow tie on Saturday. Whoa. Yeah, and I was like, okay, let's hope, hoping this comes out like the way I need it to come out, right? So I, sh- I gave them a, a, a sample of what I wanted and they were able to make it happen. But then the shoe came into play. So the shoe was like a big thing. Um, the white boot we tried it on was like, wow, this is a moment. But is this the Oscars? Like, I don't really think it's the Oscars. But you're young and you're 25. Like, have fun, you know? And we had like a, a burgundy shoe that was like very similar. But eh, but then we had this black bow tie. So it was throwing kind of everyone off in the room. Like, that black bow tie just isn't it. Like, I knew that. So I was like, how do we know? I'll change that. But what shoe? And it wasn't tailored yet because... We didn't have time to get measurements, so they only went off a sample size that they normally do for like for him, and he's fit. I typically, I typically, I typically get altered. Anyway, so long story short, um, we were between the two shoes, and I was thinking about it, and I said, okay, how do we get to this boot, and how do we, or do we go to this shoe? And I said, you know what, it's the boot. Like it's the boot. I told him, I said, when I came to fit him that following morning, I said, Stefan, it's the white boot. He said, really? I said, trust me. He said, okay. So he put it on, and he has family. He flew in his family from Toronto. Um, he had, fr- like, friends and family were all there, and he walked down the steps, down the steps, and it was like, wow, the reaction, and we knew we had made the right decision. So the creative process was very collaborative with the client, but also, like, with the design team as well, and just figuring out, like, how you make your client stand out, have their own moment, but still make sure, you know, it's on brand for the Oscars and make sure they look good within the brand that they're wearing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was a process. Yeah. That, that is a process. Intense. Yeah. The, the next question we want to ask was, how can a fashion stylist elevate their work to that next level? Uh, how can a stylist elevate their work? Um, I would say is investing in yourself. So people can see the elevation through the looks. And it's not always about brand. Like you can uh, meet... Um, emerging designers or independent designers who have great clothes too. So it's it's expanding your your network and finding looks that make the projects make sense and that actually make a statement or make an impact if you're really trying to do fashion. So I'm not always about brand because I find great looks at Zara or Topshop or whatever all the time. And oftentimes it's a credit to how it's shot as well so you're making sure you're collaborating with people who understand how to make things look expensive that may not be as expensive so um that's one way to do it and it's also maybe try to reach out to people who maybe maybe one level i don't say up you know as well reach out to photographers who you like you admire who you admire their work and who makes you for publication that you want they may they may even have an assistant if they don't work with you that may be like comparable you know it's good as well, so I think working with um, people who are not s- so much lateral, but also like maybe maybe like one level of access like ahead of you is one way to help elevate. So getting access to brands or finding independent um, designers that have great um, clothes, 
uh, working with great photographers and hair and makeup people as well. And also is getting in, getting in that room because oftentimes you get jobs based on your referrals. So if you know a great hair and makeup person, the photographer may not know you, but they may trust the hair the hair and a makeup person say, oh, he's a really great stylist. She's really great. You should bring her on. I know they can do a great job. How can a photographer shoot an H&M, a Zara, a Topshop look and make it look expensive? Do you have tips for mm, that? Okay. Lighting. Mm -hmm. I think lighting um, is key. Um, the location as well. Mm -hmm. Because... These brands, especially Zara, they are really good at fast fashion. Mm -hmm. A lot of things I'll I'll see on the runway from like the luxury brands. I'll see, um, I don't say comparable, but I'll see an item that's like it in the store shortly after. So is how does the style it pair it together and work with the photographer to understand like the lighting, the angles. It may not be, you know, uh, a full look. It may just be a, a good portrait shot that makes, like, this fabric look rich, stuff like that. Maybe you're using gels, you know, to kind of manipulate it a little bit so you can't really see, you know, sometimes the um, the quality of it. Um, I hate to say black and white because it's like, that's so easy. You, make, you know, black and white is like a cop-out sometimes. But black and white, you know, can also um, work. Um so I think those are things. So just understanding like the like the looks, the location. Because if, if it's lifestyle, it's lifestyle. Like lifestyle to me is really more about an emotion, not about the clothes. Mm -hmm. But if it comes to fashion, and it's making sure that the photographer is saying like, hey, you know, make sure this is like tailored like this, or how like how is this supposed to fit? Because fit is also key. Fit makes things look expensive when they may not be. Mm -hmm. But working with models a lot of times they're samples, so it's it's easier. It's like okay, I toss this on, and you're a hanger, and it works, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, that definitely helps a lot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, we had what, one final question from a viewer. Yeah, from Instagram. Okay. At Emily Teague asked, how do you find inspiration? I find inspiration in literally everyday life. I look through magazines often, but I like the people watch, like sitting in the airport. And I feel like people um, oftentimes set the trends. And... Um, I love just seeing how women like put things together and culturally like being Nigerian, we mix a lot of prints, like when it comes to our traditional garbs and seeing that, like seeing like my family and just things that I wouldn't even like, I wouldn't put those two fabrics together, but somehow there's a marriage there that makes sense. So I find inspiration by like people watching, um, looking at like the, uh, looking at magazines, I still uh, subscribe to like GQ. I, have, I get Vanity Fair, I get Vogue, um, I get Esquire. So I still like to touch and feel like those um, magazines. And looking at, I love looking at fashion like campaigns. Like it's definitely my dream to work with some brands to do some luxury fashion campaigns. Like those really inspire me because you can really just really push the envelope um, there. And then again, also like the youth. The youth oftentimes drives the culture, and they shift things. And you'll see things become like, oh, the Kardashians are doing, you know, box braids. But then you're like, well, my little cousin used to get box braids or Dutch braid, whatever they wanted to call them, bo boxer braids as a child. But now people are adding, like, all kinds of, like, glitter and uh, twine or thread and stuff, like, through your hair. It's like... Look at the youth and seeing what they're doing as well, because they often like shift and drive the conversation. So that's where I get my inspiration. Awesome. Was there anything we missed that you wanted to add to it? Since I know you wanted some canned stuff. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys had really good questions along with the uh, viewers as well. Mm -hmm. I think I really hit on the uh, the topic of interning and assisting yeah. you know, for mm -hmm. for newer people and really generating that that content mm -hmm. because i literally used to do like shoots test and spec shoots like three or four you know sometimes four or five a week and it's lever leveraging that to meet new people and integrity and relationship building is key in this industry because things and people like they, they come around like you'll see um a publicist at one brand and then they're off to another brand. So if you didn't return that sample or you use that sample for a person that wasn't approved for it, people will like remember those things. So mm -hmm. if you don't return your samples on time and stuff like that, like you have to maintain integrity. And 
also, there's enough work out here for all of us. Hair, makeup, nail, photographer, stylist. There's so many different lanes. So you never, I, I never look at it as competition. I'm always supportive of my fellow stylists and I champion them and cheer, cheer them on because I say what's for you is for you. So if it wasn't meant for you to have that job or that client, then it, it, it wasn't for you. Like your opportunity like will come. So I think if you keep your head down, you make sure you work hard, the work will come your way. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. It was really good to talk to you guys. Thank you. And I've loved hearing the questions from the photography community and fashion as well. So it was good to help people gain something from this. So if they're looking to like see my work or anything like that, you can follow me on Instagram, which is my first name at Apuje, A-P-U-J-E. I'm pretty active. I try to balance it out between work and like my travels. I, I travel quite often too. So that's that's my balance between work and um, my sanity is like free oh, traveling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. We really appreciate it. Yep. No problem. Thank you guys. Thank you. That's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching Photo Work. Please do us a favor and hit like and subscribe. Yeah, and don't forget to comment and tell us some people that you want us to interview. Also, don't forget to check out our suggested videos. Over here or over here, but somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. <laughs>